Hey, welcome back everyone to the Startup Studios podcast, where we interview friends of Raj and mine who build startups. And we're so grateful to have you back. How are you doing, Raj? Ah, uh, man, I'm vertical, baby. How about yourself? Doing well. It was a busy week. I know it's been super busy for you too. So, um, you know, this uh, uh, hopefully is a, a fun kind of break from the day jobs, but I'm so excited to welcome our next guest, uh, Sasha Islami. Uh, quick kind of uh, background with me and Sasha. So, um, my buddy Rand Owens, uh, my former co-founder at Startups, he knew Sasha and his co-founding team way back in the day, I think like 2011 or 12. Um, and we're going to go into the story of Wedding Snap, but the reason why Sasha is here is because I've been able to see like various entrepreneurs over the years from the earliest days and how they kind of maneuvered and pivoted and, and made, made magic happen. Sasha is one of those people who whenever I kind of think about, you know, things, um, uh, or when things get tough, he's one of my uh, kind of go-to saving graces because I, I love his story. I think he's he's got uh, an awesome attitude, which I'm excited to, to highlight. So thank you so much for being here, Sasha. Thank you. Happy to be here and happy to share my story and any other words of wisdom that people want to hear. Awesome. So I'm, I'm actually super excited to introduce my boy, Raj, uh, also my co-host and co-founder at Startup Studios. Um, he's got an exciting story of his own. So Raj, uh, please. Hey guys, what's up? Uh, welcome back. Um, we've been having a lot of fun with, with Seth. Sasha, it's a pleasure. Yeah. And Sasha, the whole point is, is you're going to help, help me out. I'm, I'm your demographic, my friend. So startup studios is supporting founders, um, started my career at, uh, energy investment banking at, 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 at Goldman, you know, quickly knew what I wanted to do. I uh, cobbled together after about 11 months, I left, cobbled together about 70 grand and I ran a hedge fund. So for, I was a finance kid for a full 12 years. For 12 years, I turned about a billion to um, a lot of fun. Our PKUM was, was a little bit more than that, but I had my exit and I and I realized, hey, I, I want to follow my passion of health and wellness, move to Seattle. And realistically, it's a tech hub. Um, we had a brick and mortar startup, which was great working with some REITs. And then it ended up having some scalability and, you know, through scalability, it's, it's the best is, is accessibility and accessibility comes through technology. So about two, you know, 17 months ago, we started our, our SaaS solution we're raising our seed and whatnot. But Sasha, you know, I'm kind of the end user demographic that startups is, is really starting to work with. Startup studios is really tar- starting to work with. Candidly, I'm a non-technical founder. That's truly who I am. And I had no network in Seattle. So I was coming into this new place saying, hey, I don't know what CAC is. I don't know what CAC to LTV ratios are. My go-to-market strategy is X. Uh, I think I have product market fit, but I'm not 100% sure. So while we make it in revenue, which has been great, you know, I know there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. Um, and then there's that imposter syndrome. You, you know, after a few months, you know, we're kicking off some good MRR. You're like, yeah, I, I got this. Like, I, I know what I'm doing. And then you're like, you hit a certain threshold and you just kind of meander. You malaise around because that's organically done and like, great. I found a small you know, problem that that penny gap theory we took over, but to really scale, we need help. We don't exactly know what we're doing. We don't know when we go from organic to inorganic or the next place. So, you know, Startup Studios is, is basically a network of, of people who can help guys like me. Um, so Sasha, you know, towards the end, we'd love to know exactly outside of your skill set and your experience, kind of the rages that you want to work with in the world, where you're kind of your bread and butter is you're like, hey, man, I love the healthcare side. Look, think of this, think of this, think of this, think of this all that type of iteration. So that's kind of what we built out. And Seth and Seth and I have been having a lot of fun getting some quality people on the on the show. Exciting. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Of course. No, oh, well, um, with that, actually, let's just dive right into it. So the usually the way we frame the intro is who is Sasha Islam? So I'll let you uh, get started. All right. Um, all right, so I'll take it back. I was born in Iran, and I grew up back and forth between Iran and Birmingham, Alabama. Most of my childhood, I was in Iran, but I was going back and forth. And so I kind of grew up in both places, um, growing up um, not being um, super native at any, any, any language. Um, and kind of felt off in, in either of the places. Um, and, and yeah, and then when I was in um, the last time that I, you know, lived in Iran, I was in high school for three years over there. And the last year we came back to Birmingham, Alabama again, where I went to community college. And then I went to Atlanta for 
um, college. I studied engineering, industrial engineering at Georgia Tech. And um, it was a very tough uh, five years of my life trying to balance um, the heavy engineering workload. And at the same time, having a couple of jobs, I was the president of a few organizations and trying to balance all of that and social life, um, it, it was tough. And, uh, but I learned how to make it happen. That was the, probably the most important thing that I learned in college. It's like how to um, pull it off and finally, you know, be able to get yourself past the finish line, no matter how you look like. Um, that was a big lesson that I learned from college. And um, from right outside of college, I, um, I don't know if I'm going too much into the to my resume or, or this is yeah. it's a bit. But <laughs> however you want to tell your story, man, this is your time. Yeah. And, and Sasha, I think you, you also hit on something really interesting. I, I myself and maybe even Seth himself, you know, immigrant founders, we have this duality, but we're not always enough for one side of the coin and we're not always enough for the other side of the coin. So it's it's yeah. it's hard. It's really hard. So I'm glad you're speaking to it because of those pockets yeah. of where's your network? I'm like, it's all yeah. over the place. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. And I think depending on where in the US you also grew up, um, there are definitely more challenges to that, right? Like, like, like Alabama, South, yeah, Alabama or Atlanta, you know, almost no person of color really wants to be a person of color, you know, back, back there, you know, um, un unless you, or it's, it's still very, Atlanta was very segregated. I remember like, um, meeting the, the, you know, the Persian people who, the Iranians who grew up, you know, in California versus other places around the U.S. The ones in California, um, they could speak better Persian than I did. You know, who, who even grew up, you know, um, mostly in Iran in childhood. Um, but the ones who grew up outside of California, almost it was as if uh, it was a, badge of honor to not speak even your mother tongue, you know, because you wanted to be um, American so bad to fit in with, you know, the, the, the types of people in Atlanta and Alabama and, and all that. Right. And the same was also, I noticed the same is also for other kids, the, the Indians, you know, the Chinese, you know, and so on. Right. Uh, because it was, it was tough in those, you know, the, it, it wasn't a racist culture, but, Everybody was super race aware, you know, super like, okay, you no, know, where are you from? You know, where are you really from? Okay. And, and also um, thinking of you like that. Wow. So, I mean, was Georgia Tech any better than, because assuming again, right, like um, Alabama, I'm, I'm assuming that it was tougher for somebody like you to grow up. Did you feel any kind of sense of like, relief or belonging when you were able to move into college? Because usually they try to promote that ecosystem and that environment also to thrive, right? Yeah, um, that's a good question. You know, um, when I was in Alabama, I was, I was a kid. So I was, um, you know, I went to middle school with like 99% black kids and 1% Mexican. And I was the only one who was not Hispanic, not not black, um, so that was a kind of different demographics. Um, and in elementary school, it was too mixed to to even you know, and we were too young to even like recognize those um, kind of challenges. But in at Georgia Tech, it was on some levels it was very open and very really accepting, but among the general population, most of the kids were from the South, right? So even though um, maybe um, racially or physically, there was, there was a good bit of diversity in terms of mentality, in terms of, you know, accents, in terms of ways of thinking, there was still heavy bias towards the, you know, 
the mainstream kind of American, especially Southern mentality. And was it at Georgia Tech too? Or? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was saying. Is uh, that's how Georgia Tech was, you know. Um, and I, but Sasha, I think it's really apropos too, because Seth, you might not know, but I, I'm from Texas, born and raised, um, and I did Louisiana. So mm. it's always interesting because you'll get not in California, maybe not in Seattle where I'm now, Sasha. But it's like, oh, where are you from? It's like, oh, I'm from Arizona. It's like, no, but where are you really from? It is unequivocally the second question that comes, and you're like, "Oh, I'm, I'm Middle Eastern." And you're like, "Oh, uh huh." So it's it's so interesting. It's it's always followed up with that second question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, you know that, that that's definitely true for me as well. And I think for me, the, even the first question is very tough. You know, it's like when you like when you say, "Okay, where are you from?" Okay, well, where how 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 do I go at this? You know. <laughs> Where do I go? Um, yeah, but Growing it was it was places. yeah, and but what was very eye opening was I think coming to the Bay Area, where that mattered you know the least that I've ever seen, and then later on when I moved to New York that really nothing mattered you know you could be whoever whatever you know doing anything and you're just New Yorker now that's it. Um, it's very amazing to experience the different shades of that. No, that's awesome. So uh, you were you were kind of talking, uh, right? We were at Georgia Tech, or at this part of your, phase in your life. You were studying. Uh, you said industrial engineering. What was the rationale behind it? What What were your interests at the time? Yeah, I was before actually going to college. I was very interested in becoming a kind of like a business guy, right? I don't know what that meant. Kind of like making high level business decisions. You know, I was fascinated with like corporations, CEOs, executive, that sort of mentality, that sort of thinking. And I'm like, okay, what do I study? And okay, maybe I should go towards management, but management is like one of the lowest kind of degrees in the totem pole of, at, at Georgia Tech, you know, which is a main engineering school. So I'm like, you know, and then on the other hand, industrial engineering was the number one major um, that Georgia Tech has in the whole world. And it's been the number one for like over 20 years at that time, right? So it was famous for it. Um, and then I'm studying, I'm, I'm like learning about this industrial engineering. What is it about? And that's when I realized it's kind of like um, business meets engineering on crack, and uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is interesting. This is, you know, this is a nice way to put the two together. And I already had a, you know, kind of mathematical engineering mind. Um, so that's when I decided to pursue industrial engineering. And then when I was in Atlanta, even before going to college, my family knew some, knew some Iranians in Atlanta. And you, you know how every ethnicity has some sort of like, I don't know, some sort of occupation career that they're more into, you know, in every country. <laughs> so for Iranians, it's a lot about development, real estate development, right? And real estate and real estate development and all that, right? So obviously these guys, like, um, they were like big shot developers, you know, multiple, you know, complexes and shit like that. And I was like, man, this is really interesting. So I got really attracted to maybe in the future, I can also be like a business you know, real estate tycoon developer, stuff like that. Um, actually, I used to read Donald Trump's books before, you know, any of the, all this before 2006, you know, before I went to college. Um, so so I, I started Georgia Tech being double majored as building construction and industrial engineering. I wanted to do, do the two at the same time. And the challenge is that the first year of building construction major is the same year as the architecture kind of major because they're both part of the same school of architecture. So you have to go through studio, design, all of that. And for anybody who's done architecture, they know that why the other name of architecture is archi torture, uh, because you're just going to be spending so much time in studio and after the first semester, 
I was like, no, nah, this is not for me. This is, <laughs> this is, um, I, I, I have too much, too many hobbies, interests and things like that. And I cannot, you know, do this. So I decided to double down on industrial engineering, which was a very hard decision. I remember when I, when I made the decision to um, drop my studio class, it was a hard decision because if I drop it, I cannot take it again the next semester. I have to wait again the next year to take it again. Um, so it was, that was it. Um, I remember I was like crying, you know, having some tears that, okay, this is like a defeat of defeat, but at the same time, a, a sense of relief, a sense of more clarity towards where I want to go. But, um, you know, closing a chapter is always really tough, right? And that I've, I've had that multiple times in my life since then. But I think that was one of the first times that I really felt like, oh man, closing this chapter, it's so tough. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. So it's probably actually a really good experience, Seth, um, that Sasha went through because candidly, like, I think I was talking to you, like my friend, he's had his coffee startup for like 14 years and he's, and he's like, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm stubborn and I'm, I'm tough and I'm working hard. I'm like, I, I love you, man. But at some point you just gotta yeah. be like, Hey, here's reality. And not in a bad way, like not in a yeah. bad way. And candidly like you saw that you made that decision you said you did it in the future too so it may even you know prepped you for like a pivot or whatever it might be type thing which is you know yeah a good idea yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. so yeah. What, what happened what, what what was your head at or where was your head at right after you graduated and what was like the next phase or next plan so in my last year in college i so I, you know, I was attracted to everything that all the other, you know, business kind of people were attracted to, especially industrial engineering. I wanted to get into consulting, you know, the top three, Bain, McKinsey, VCG. You know, I was the president of the Institute of Industrial Engineers, which was the biggest student-run organization for industrial engineering. You know, I had all the connections for the top recruiters. So before... Uh, the summer of my third year in college where everybody gets all the best internships and then they'd land, you know, a fucking high paying job. I was, I was lined up. I had my uh, round two of BCG, Bain, McKinsey, like which a, a very few people even had those interviews at our college. Um, so I had that lined up, but all of a sudden I wasn't able to get anything. I got rejected from all of them. Um, <laughs> so it was then a point that I had to, I was like, well, now I don't have anything to do this summer besides from take, taking classes, taking courses. So it was the first summer that I stayed on campus and I took some courses and um, it was a very life-changing summer for me because during that summer, I stayed in a, in a fraternity house that I met one of the guys over there who he was reading a different book almost every day, you know, we are talking about all these books he's reading, who taught, he taught, he told me about Y Combinator, the, the tech ecosystem and, and all that, and opened my eyes to this world that I, I knew nothing about, right, uh, to the world of tech. And um, so then he inspired me to basically start my first startup, my last year in college, I started a startup called Mingle with two L's. And I read everything about all the polygrams, essays, and everything to do with um, startups. So we started this startup with like, first we were like five co-founders. <laughs> uh, we did this startup competition program um, competing. And the idea was, the, actually the idea is still good to this day, is a, it was a LinkedIn plus four square for conferences, right? Basically you go to conferences to meet people but you have to shake a lot of hands, kiss a lot of babies, but you still don't meet the right people. So this would, you'd enter the conference, you would look at this app and it would tell you, okay, this is Raj, he's the CEO of such and such, and here's, you know, your common connections, boom. And here's like, he's taking this workshop at, over here and you can message him and schedule time to meet, you know, after the, the session together, right? So- What year was this? 
This was 2010. Yeah. That's really interesting too, because, you know, you'll go to a conference for three days and it's that one random coffee, like on the last day when you're walking out of the airport, you're like, what the, that makes it all worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's crazy. It's still that problem exists, right? It is. And (laughs) yeah. So at that time that was like smartphones were not even mainstream yet. You know, business people had them, but business people had Blackberries, right? The main you know, conference smartphone was BlackBerry. So we had to build a BlackBerry app. We had to hire somebody to do BlackBerry. And um, that was the first time that we learned. Uh, it's not about the idea. It's not about the product. But um, I mean, it's not just that, but it's also distribution. And how do you get get yourself there? We realized the only way to be able to get this idea off the ground is that you, we need to make a partnership with the organizers and, and pre-feed the registration feed into the app. So when people come use the app, all the information is already there. You know, they don't need to go through putting their information, sign up and all that, right? And working with organizers, they didn't care. That's not one of the things that they care about. They cared about other things, right? So we, we learned a hard lesson, uh, took us a year, year and a half, and also, how to work with co-founders and so on. So going back to your question, what, what was my mind uh, finishing college? Um, my mind was that I want to go down the path of making my own business, not because I take pride in having my own business, but because I didn't want to take a dumb job as pushing paper, you know, um, which a lot of college graduates do, right? Um, I didn't want that. And also I knew like my chances of being able to get a good job um, that can also sponsor a visa for me because I was an international student, you know, it's gonna be very low, right? So uh, my only option was to kind of create my own job. So through, through Mingle, one, one of the co-founders, uh, we decided after we shutting down Mingle, after we graduated, I graduated, we decided to get an apartment together in Atlanta, a two bedroom apartment together and just focus on different ideas. You know, uh, we were reading about how to come up with good ideas, you know, all the different essays and things like that. And we went through that summer, we went to maybe, we went through maybe 10 different ideas. And every time we were working on different ideas, we were learning something new, right? And we had a lot of like, really big ideas, very dumb ideas. Like one of the ideas was to, yeah, it was a time that Facebook like button just got, you know, super popular. And uh, me and my co-founder, we had, we made up this challenge between us, you know, kind of competition between us. Imagine we would both um, print out physical like stickers, you know, with Facebook kind of like on it. Um, Let's see who can sell more of these, you know, and come up with a business plan, right? So he would go door to door and try to sell in businesses in Bucket in Atlanta. And I would do like an online strategy, you know, with that. So we're trying kind of like competing, but also learning through this competition together um, through different things that I wouldn't, we wouldn't have. Um, so, yeah, so that summer, it was when we um, decided to shut down Mingle very early on focus on different ideas, every time learning something new, learning something new. Um, And then, you know, taking these lessons. And then what happened is that my co-founder, he had a girlfriend at the time who was a receptionist at a hotel in Atlanta uh, of a big hotel intercontinental. And she told us, yo, there's this, um, interesting high-end Jewish wedding that's happening. And and we jokingly said, oh, maybe we should crash it, right? So we ended up, you know, we were, we were pretty ballsy. So we were like, let's crash this wedding. Um, we show up to the wedding. Um, we knew the name of the couple, you know, and, th- and that's it, right? We show up to the wedding. And in the beginning, we noticed everybody's wearing these uh, yarmulkes. I think they have a different name. I forgot. Every time they correct me, it's not the yarmulke. But 
a lot of people refer to those yarmulke, you know, but anyways, everybody was wearing that. And we were like, how do we get one of these, right? And my uh, co-founder's girlfriend knew that they're gonna, everybody's going to be wearing one of these. So she only had one of these herself that she got from somewhere else. She wasn't even Jewish, but it was a hot pink one. You know, it was one that was hot pink, right? <laughs> So, and I'm telling my girlfriend, David, hey, you cannot wear this, man. This is like too obvious. You know, this is like. <laughs> so, anyways, he goes around and to find one, um, they have apparently the basket of them. He finds one for me as well. And we go inside the wedding and uh, there's first a cocktail reception. We're kind of like nervous, scared, like, what do we do? And then there's a ceremony that everybody goes sit and we go to sit and obviously we're sitting on the wrong side it's like men and women are separate you know we see on women's side they're like no you got to go sit on the other side so we go sit on the other side and that's when uh, the idea for the next business that we launched came up because we noticed during the ceremony this was a fancy wedding they had a bunch of photographers videographers everybody is standing up and taking their own photos with their phones right i'm like yeah what's going on here right this is strange. And at that time, we were just in so much idea stage looking for problems, looking for problems to solve. Like, wait, how did the bride and groom get these photos? Like, do they even want these photos? Do they not want, want, not want these photos? So um, long story short, that, that you know, um, wedding was a good experience for us to get exposed to that problem of how do the bride and groom get the photos and the videos that all the guests capture? And does that have any value? So this idea pops up and we, then we start running our um, customer discovery matrix says, let's test out our hypothesis. How do we test this? How do we test that? Let's talk to event planners. Let's talk to photographers. Uh, let's talk to past brides and all that. And uh, let's talk to our friends. Uh, and that was the when, where the idea for Wedding Snap, which was the startup that later on turned into Eversnap, and then we sold it to one of our competitors for the next eight year journey. That's where it all started. And no, that's amazing. And uh, so um, I'm, I'm glad I, I didn't realize David was also your uh, your co founder previously at Georgia Tech. That's awesome. Uh, he's yeah. gonna be a future guest as well. Um, I've I've already messaged him. He's an awesome personality on the engineering side. But yeah. so wedding snap, right? You guys finally like you're still in Atlanta at this point, and um, I, I love the story about you guys renting out like a two bedroom apartment together. And because it, I I went to your hat your the ever snap offices in San Jose all the time. It's amazing, <laughs> and that culture uh, you know makes a lot more sense now. But you guys are are in Atlanta. You now have to have this idea. Kind of walk us through, like, you know, what what forced you into deciding after this entire period of time where you're thinking about different ideas. Why was this the one to go after? Yeah. Why? So that summer, like I was saying, every time we tested out an idea, we learned something new, right? So for example, does it have market value? Does it have do, do people want it? You know, that's, a, that's an obvious one, right? But there's also some not so obvious one as if like, like do we have a passion for this problem, right? Uh, sometimes people, they're so into, oh, I want to make a startup, I want to make a business, that they don't think, okay, do I really want this? Do I really like to focus on it? Yeah, there's a lot of problems that exist in the world. You know, there's a lot of ways to get rich, but do I really want to do this, right? Another one of the ideas that we worked in was an idea that, was very needed um, and that was an idea that you know um, I started reading um, more and more through audiobooks right reading normal books was very tough for me you know slow reader but when I discovered audiobooks I've been reading like almost two books a month 30 40 books a, week, a year um, so one idea was had was to turn any digital uh, PDF or anything that people want into audio, but through human voice, not through robot voice and hire like cheap labor, you know, college students, whatever, to just be able to turn something into a voice and give it back to people. Um, and, and we even did the market research for that. It was potential. There was different industries and so on. But my co-founder was like, Hey, I'm not passionate about that. Right. Um, that's not my thing. Um, so for wedding snap, what, 
it checked multiple boxes, you know, after we did our research and we knew that we, we can't be married to this idea. From, from Mingo, we learned that every idea has a lot of faults into it, that you have to be open-minded, right? So when we did our search, we found out, okay, it has market potential, right? Uh, past brides talk about it, that there was, is a need, they're begging their guests and so on. Is an area that we're interested in because we could see like this could not just be for weddings, it can be for other events as well. Um, and beyond that, we, it, the distribution was also clear, right? So it was a niche target market. We knew, okay, there's a lot of wedding magazines, wedding stuff. The distribution is very clear. The only thing that was a concern was, okay, yeah, you, you're probably not going to have repeat customers as much, right? Uh, but that wasn't a concern of us at that time. We would just want to think, okay, if we can get it enough up to this level, that's better than any idea we've ever had, you know, and we'll figure out the rest later. Um, and that summer was a very tough summer for us because both of us didn't have any money and we were airbnb our apartment, the two bedroom. We put both of the rooms on Airbnb and we were both living in the living room um, just to be able to pay for the cost, which is, this is actually a common theme within the next 10 years. Every time we get into trouble, Airbnb came and saved us. <laughs> Uh, it, yeah and um and yeah and then we started wedding snap and with wedding snap it was it it wasn't clear at that time you know i'm i'm, I'm talking like everything's clear but actually at that time it wasn't clear that this is going to be a hit people are going to like it people are not going to like it because I, w- I was actually listening to somebody say it yesterday the other and i've been thinking about this all the time it's like your your friends are your worst support network for entrepreneurship, right? Um, your friends who knew you from before you were an entrepreneur, you were started like that, they don't understand you. They don't get you. Parts of them, they don't want, parts of them don't want you to change, right? They, they put you in the box as you are this kind of person and you can do this sort of things. And it's very hard for 99% of the people to really support your new entrepreneurship endeavors, right? With the best of intention. So even when we would ask our friends to help us to refer us to past brides, this, that, here we are two guys in our early 20s talking about a wedding industry business, you know. Um, none of us have either had a, like even a long-term relationship, you know, for, for more than a few months, right? Uh, so it was very hard to get any help, you know. Um, but we kind of went above and beyond to get enough signals to see, okay, this idea has merit uh, but soon after that my co-founder was also from italy david was from italy he was there for, on a visa his visa was expiring he had to go back to italy we didn't have a way to bring him back in um, i had to get a job um, i was also about to become illegal you know to, I had to get a job how to pay for my when i graduated i told my parents hey give me six months and i'll get to profitability if not i'll go get a job and six months was coming up. So um, when that happened, it was a failure for us. We were like, this is it. That, that was a cool idea. Maybe someone someday at some point will do it. It's not going to be us. We failed um, saying goodbye to each other at the airport. And he went back to Italy. I went to, to find jobs. I found a job. Um, as an office, you know, engineer, you know, entry level job at this company called Unisource that makes a bunch of shit, uh, doing some dumb job, you know, from nine to five. It was mindless to see like the person who is like 55 years old in the next cubicle next to me is doing the same exact job as me, right? <laughs> uh, and then, and at the same time, David went back to Italy and he, he was looking for jobs as well. And he was also not able to find any job that he likes. So we are like, okay, why don't we just continue working on this, you know, remotely and just see where it goes. So at my job, I remember I'm like switching tabs. I'm like secretly working on, you know, wedding snap and so on. Um, and then um, like less than three months, you know, I, I had, my job was to purchase kind of raw materials for the factories, you know, online. 
through some you know dumb UI that everything was kind of clear. I just had to press buttons and could look at a couple of things. And anyways, I ordered the wrong raw material and cost the company like twenty thousand dollars, right? And uh, but this is like a multi bazillion dollar company, like twenty grand and nothing, but it's still noticeable, right? So the manager, who's like this super calm, quiet guy, introverted, you know, he brings me into his office and I notice that um, there's him, there's his boss, then his his boss's boss on the phone, Oops. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, oh shit, here we go. All right. So that's when I get fired from the job and I'm like, shit. Um and mind you, even before then, I wasn't like the exemplary employee. Like I was trying to leave as soon as it's five or a couple of minutes before five. But then I would leave and go to a Starbucks and work there till like 2 a.m., you know, on my, on my own startup. Um, so I get fired. And I remember that at that time I was, I was going to pick up my then, then girlfriend to go to L.A. together for, for a week of vacation. And before I was arguing with her that, hey, I can't pick you up early because I'm at work. Then all of a sudden I'm texting, hey, I can pick you up anytime. You know, I'm free. <laughs> so she's like, yo, I'm what's out. going on? <laughs> yeah. So, and that's when it kind of hit me. Oh, fuck. You know, life is going to take a huge turn right now. I've been thinking about going to Silicon Valley for a while. David and I, his last few days in the U.S., before going back to Italy, we took a trip, a 10 day trip to San Francisco Bay area to see what is the Silicon Valley that Paul Graham talks about, right? And um, that's totally inspired us, man, this is, this is the place we need to be. So when that happened, I'm like, I need to leave. I need to leave Atlanta, I need to go to Silicon Valley. But it was a very bitter, sad, with full of sorrow kind of um, leaving because I had no plans of what to do. How am I going to survive in this land that I don't know anything about? And, and shit's going to be so much more expensive when I can barely even pay my own credit card, card bills from before. So then I, um, you know, I pack my bags, whatever I have, and, and move to um, Palo Alto where um, I found a middle school friend uh, from Iran that was um, studying at Stanford. And I asked him, hey, can I stay with you for a couple of weeks? For a few days. I said, can I stay with you for a few days? <laughs> I ended up staying there for a couple of weeks in his dorm room on a, on a two-seat couch, you know, I'm sleeping, you know, <laughs> in his dorm room at Stanford until I finally am able to find this, like the cheapest room in Palo Alto for like $700 a month plus utilities. Back the then. Startup house. Yeah, back then, you know, nice. but I went to like, I went to like the first time I went to supermarket in Palo Alto, I had, I had kind of like a senior citizen moment. I had like a panic. It's, I was like, yo, the price is here. Everything like double, triple Atlanta. How am I going to make it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a big shock. Yeah. Wow. And so uh, what was like, was there a difference in energy? Because, you know, as somebody who had heard of Silicon Valley um, and then actually as a starving entrepreneur made the jump, was it worth it? Or were you like second guessing yourself still? Um, was it worth it? Um, you know, in Atlanta, there was starting to become this kind of entrepreneur startup scene, you know, but... Uh, the word that comes to my mind is that it was mostly a joke, right? It was mostly, it's very early on kind of tech startup. You know, it's still, to whoever you talk to, they want to see a patent for your idea. You know, they want to see, oh, do you have a patent defensible that, idea? That's technology you know? to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's technology to them, you know? Um, later on, I found out that even Silicon Valley has that side of investors as well, you know? Uh, there's definitely two different camps of investors here in Silicon Valley as well. Um, but Atlanta was like 99.9% .9 that, you know, and the, all the ideas were like old school backwards. And you had to, you know, like, you have to tell them like, no, man, Paul Graham says this, here's how, you know, the new uh, startup works. Um, in Silicon Valley, when I went to Palo Alto, like 
these ideas were much more accepted. All of a sudden you feel like, oh man, we're speaking the same language. It feels so exciting to be able to even communicate with people, right? And seeing a lot of people who have the same passion, who have the same drive, you know, a lot of other crazy people like, like us um, who are not just doing a hobby to then get a job. No, they really want to make, make shit happen. Um, that's a that's a really good point, actually. I, I totally forgot. There was a long time in the Bay where people were doing a short startup, like a short stint for the resume. Um, like after a year or so, like they would get, you know, when you start off and especially if when you have a family or your own financial reasons, you give yourself that deadline, right? Like, okay, I'll give myself six months or 12 months. But then the kind of the fallback on that was after 12 months, I can go out, get a job, tell somebody, you know, I, I failed as an entrepreneur. It's part of the story and, and, um, you know, go back to the nine to five. Um, yeah. So, yeah that's, thank you for, for adding that. Yeah. So at, yeah. At what point did you guys then like, so, I mean, you're, you're staying at your friend's couch, Eversnap or, or wedding snap uh, back then you're still working on it. You and David remotely. At what point did you guys actually apply or think about applying to like YC or 500? So we were still far from any sort of market fit or any kind of, at this point, like it's still like, you, you're like, we still don't know if we have anything here. We're just doing it. Let's see where it goes. Um, I was definitely, I, 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 I wanted to apply for jobs because I didn't, we didn't think wedding stamp is going to make it, you know? But at the same time, I couldn't make myself apply for jobs because it was just the idea was just not going through my head, right? Um, so what happened is that we contacted all the different, you know, um, wedding distribution channels that we could find, blogs, things. Nobody was interested. And they would be only interested, they would, blogs would only write about us if we paid them to write, which I was like, what? Wait, that, that's a thing, you know? Um, but we contacted um, Wedding Channel because they had this website that was kind of like Groupon, but for weddings, that every week they would make a new deal. And they were like, they really liked the idea because here's the wedding industry is very localized, right? You like all the photographers, they're all local. They're not national. Most of the things are not national. And here there is this product that they can sell nationally on their, on their website. So they feature us and all of a sudden we get, I think like 10, 15 grand the first week of sales. And this is like the most that they've ever sold of any product they've ever had, right? So they feature us another week, you know, we total, we make over 20, 25K, you know, for those two weeks. And that's when our life starts, right? That's when wedding snaps starts. We're like, holy shit, this works. There is this, you know, we can turn this into a business. Um, that's when, you know, we get David's visa again, bring him back to the U S we start off getting an office at plug and play. Um, uh, and, and yeah, that's when Rand, you know, was one of our first interns that summer we hired, um, I went crazy. I was like, okay, I'm going to get 10 interns. I got 10 interns. <laughs> so <laughs> really bad idea. Do not do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we had offers at plug and play. And that's when we started, and we started making good money. We, we, you know, the thing that, oh, these blogs get paid to write about us. At first we were like, we were like, what the fuck? Then it was like, wait, actually that's a good thing. We can actually pay these blogs to write about us for so cheap, right? So we ended up like getting featured on all these top blogs, getting really good SEO. We were making really good money. We made up to like, I don't remember exactly, but 40, 50 K a month, um, during the summer months. Uh, but at that time we were like, Oh no, all the money should be going back to business. So we weren't taking anything off the table and not paying ourselves anything besides like living costs, covering our living costs. Uh, and that too, I should add, you guys were, were living together too. So it was yeah, still very much like a bootstrap company. Yeah. First, we had a two-bedroom place in Sunnyvale, right, right across from Plug and Play, which we used to walk from, you know. Um, and then um, we brought engineers. My, my uh, 
David from Italy, he had some connections with the universities there. We found out that we can get very good engineer interns to build this stuff for us, bring them from Italy here, right? So, and they would love it as well to get the Silicon Valley experience. So they would come and live with us. We would pay them very minimal up to nothing, you know, um, to help us build and um, would cover some of the costs, the living costs and all of that. And for three, six months at a time. And then our apartment got, you know, four or five of us living there together. So then we need to have a bigger place. That's when we got the seven bedroom house in San Jose across from Valley Fair Mall, uh, calling it the Eversnap Mansion. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you see where there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now those are really fun times. And and well, you you skimmed through this briefly, but like, so you guys actually went through five hundred startups too, and not like five hundred or these accelerated programs today. These are still very early on, maybe like less than a few hundred portfolio companies still figuring yeah. it out. Um, yeah. so tell us a little more about that experience. Like, why did you feel the need to apply or, or to for yeah. these places? And then how was that experience? Um, so we were making money, which, which Dave McClure really loved at that time, right? Um, and and 500 was also back in the day, the very first time that we came to Silicon Valley, that, that Davis last 10 days, we actually crashed 500's demo day. Um, one of our pa favorite pastime hobbies was to crash events uh, because we didn't have any money to go to anything. We, uh, we just found out different ways to crash, which I, later on I even write, wrote an article about it that got featured on Hacking News and stuff. But, um, so through crashing the events, uh, we met like some people at 500, some mentors, you know, one of the mentors, James Levin, who was very kind to us, you know, it's very hard to find uh, people who are kind to you in, in the startup scene, you know, um, and, but handful of few, handful of people stand out, you know, and he was one of them. He was one of the mentors at 500. He was kind to us for no reason. Uh, when we didn't have anything, you know, just two random guys crashing events. Um, and, and also, so, um, where was it going? What was your question here? What was it going with this? Uh, about oh, 500. 500 yeah. stuff. Okay. So by the time we approached 500 again to kind of get into the program, get be connected to the network, that's what we wanted to do, get connected. We were already making money, right? We weren't making a lot of money. We were also making a lot of dumb decisions and burning a lot of money, which is the whole story by itself. Um, so they liked our our kind of metrics, what we're going for, the industry and all of that. And they were like, you know what? Uh, maybe you're beyond the incubator because we already had um, 10, 15 people working for us, right? So we're just going to give you this small, you know, 25K to be part of our portfolio, right? And on one hand, we were like, oh, I'm not a part of Incubator. You know, on the other hand, we're like, but this, they're taking a lot less percentage from us for just 25K. Uh, and we also didn't want to negotiate to get, cancel the whole deal. So we're like, fuck it, you know? So so we actually never went through the whole accelerator program. We were, we were a portfolio company, which I don't know if there's the, they have this distinction nowadays, but back in the day, you, you were a batch company or you're a portfolio company, right? And both had its honors, you know, and, and it, we would kind of like be proud. Oh, we didn't need to go through the batch. We, they just gave us money, right? Um, so, and so we did get to use a lot of the resources. David and I, we used to almost book every mentor uh, office hours that would come online. Like we had an alert that would send us SMS when when the email would come, so and so is posted office hours. We're like, boom, the first one will be <laughs> to book it <laughs> for a while because we were just so hungry for like good resources and guidances and so on. Um, so that aspect it helped. Other than that, um, nowadays I think they help with um, investor intros and things like that as well. But back in the day. Uh, the investor intros, it wasn't as active I mean, they weren't as actively doing it. They, they let the founders do most of the work. Um, and especially for portfolio companies, we didn't get any help from them um, for raising rounds. So we had to do all the work ourselves. 
and um, which was very tough. I learned a huge, huge lesson that I wish somebody had told me years before is that it's not your product, it's not your metric, it's not that. Uh, it is that, but also it's the people you know and the people that you know that know you. Um, as a 23, 24 year old, that was it was such a sad um, kind of epiphany. It was such a uh, because to build a network, it takes a long time, right? You had these founders who were in their 30s and their 40s. They already knew, you know, or they knew they had a network from network from network and they knew how to connect everything together and, and have people that they can enter them and all that. We didn't have anything, anybody. Here we are, we're having growth, you know, 30% growth month over month. We're making 50, 60K a month. We have all these amazing metrics to show but we can't even get investor meetings, right? Um, that's when it hit me really hard. It's like, it's like when you did all the job that they said, okay, this is what you need to do to become successful. And then they're like, no, nah, but that's not it. You know, um, it felt unfair. And um, so we weren't able to raise much money um, besides 500 startups and then plug and play at the time money like was kind of on a rolling basis from whoever we could get raised from um, until a couple of years later, we kind of, we built a network and started doing like fundraising the right way. Awesome. So like, so you guys were pretty, from a funding standpoint, you guys stayed in the pre-seed to seed range for like the first couple of years, easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at, at one point did things kind of explode? <laughs> <laughs> it depends explode in what way you know? <laughs> but when you felt like things yeah. were finally working out um well business wise at every time things were working out in some senses and not in the other senses right so in the beginning we had really good revenue you know we were making money you know so that was working really well we were, we were like profitable right um, but putting everything back in the business, doubling down in that industry, then we got to get a lot more competitors, um, which brought down our market share because they were giving it for free, you know, something that did 70% of what we did. Um, started not making as much money and also our costs started raising and raising with photo sharing and server costs and all that. So then we decided going back to that, is this our passion or not? Uh, we wanted to expand to all events, right? So not just weddings. And because everybody was also telling us, hey, I want to use this for something else, this, that. So that's when we created Eversnap as a tool to be able to address all events. But then a premium feature set for weddings that we would still sell at $100 a wedding, right? Um, so we, then our metrics started changing, going from sales and revenue and um, those sort of metrics to um, monthly active users, right? To how many eyeballs are looking at our platform because now we're just general photo sharing platform that anyone can use. And uh, it was, we said it's free up to 20 people for your album and then more than that get paid. But we weren't really monitoring it. We, we didn't really care much about the money at that point. We were like, oh, we're going this Instagram route that getting the active users, daily actives and all of that. And then we're going to raise based on that. And we got some really good metrics month over month. Um, um, actives growing, you know, 30, 40%. Um, we wanted to raise again, but then it was bad timing um, for do that sort of business model. You know, the photo sharings of the world have had already been done. Right. And this is like 2013, 2014. Um, Two VCs come along. One, I think, was the Vegas fund that wanted to put 700K. Um, the other one, another company, I wanted to put 400K. And, um, and last minute, both of them fall off the planet. And we're like, fuck. Now we have, I think, 17, 20 people who are working for us. And we are running out of money. Like this month, next month, we are running out of money. Okay. Uh, so I have a um, come to Jesus 
kind of meeting with all the employees like hey this is what's happening and you know we had to lay people off and so we lay off everybody a bunch of other people also leave and it ends up being me my co-founder david um one of our first interns michelle who quit college um to stay with us and then her and david were dating also so then they become married now that they got a kid um and uh and our first employee so we went from like over 20 people to just the four of us right um and not having any en enough revenue to be able to sustain ourselves we put all the rooms in the airbnb in, in our everstar mansion on airbnb except david and michelle's room um i was sleeping in the hallway for around a year year and a half um, the first few months was because we I, we had to, we didn't have enough money. But then I was like, oh, if I sleep in one of the rooms, I'm going to take like $1,500 a month away. <laughs> I'd rather just sleep in the hallway. It's okay. Um, so um, it's funny. I, at that time, even my girlfriends would come and like, you know, they would just sleep with me in the, in the mattress in the hallway, you know, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's when we kind of pivoted and made a whole other business plan, right? Then, then we like, okay, we need to pivot. This is not sustainable. And then we went towards a professional market, a professional photography um, kind of idea. That's when we, we noticed there's a huge problem in the professional photography market, which is a tangential um, industry that it's very hard to hire a professional photographer for small events, right? Mm -hmm. You need to go through so many portfolios, who's available, negotiate, what if the guy shows up, what if doesn't, then they nickel and dime you for every photo that they take. You're like, man, what, why don't we just vet the photographers, make these agreements with them. You come to our website, you say, hey, I have a birthday party this Saturday, I want a photographer 7 to 10 p.m. We already vet it, you already pay $100 an hour, everything's done for you, right? Kind of streamlining, uh, photography, right? Professional photography. So we did some tests with that at, at the beginning. I was, um, I like testing ideas without code. So I was testing, you know, this idea myself. I hate photography myself doing any sort of professional photography, but I put out some Craigslist post and like, Hey, I'm offering, you know, um, professional photography for three hours for, I think like 60 bucks, a bunch of people contacted me. Right. And I got some Google images to show my portfolio, right? So <laughs> bunch of people contacted me. I was like, okay, there's something here. I raised the price. I raised the price. There's something here. Um, tested the idea. Um, I can talk more about how I tested and all that if you guys want. But um, the what came out is that it, you know, we noticed there's a problem here that, to be solved. And then I convinced the rest of the team, okay, let's build the MVP. And then pursue it and then over overall we started scaling it to becoming the almost the second biggest photography company in the u.s um having photographers in all 50 states um covering all sorts of events um and and also bringing revenue right and uh, giving jobs to photographers and also having 50 percent margins for ourselves scaling and so on that and the, this was business. under this was under Eversnap or did you use it? Like yeah, this was under Eversnap. We just called it Eversnap Photography. Yeah. Uh, Sasha, super cool. But so the almost like a, a pseudo marketplace for matching, you know, okay. how on the yeah. on the business side, when you're getting that point, you said 50% margins is great. So if one's off transactions, am I, if I'm the photographer, am I paying a monthly subscription? I, is it only when I get matched? you transactional fees? Is it a path through? Like kind of what was the model on that? Because it might not be recurring revenue. So... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it was mainly, um, it was kind of like Uber, right? Where we would match you with a photographer, right? Uh, but you wouldn't know who and where, yeah, you, you don't have any say in what photographer you want, right? You say, hey, you have, a, you have a birthday party. We know on our end who's best for birthdays. We say, okay, Seth is the guy for you. Uh, you're going to pay $100 an hour. It's a flat rate for everybody, you know? Um, and then for the photographer, we had a different deal, right? If they Got just it. started off with us, they would pay 40 based on the number of five-star reviews that we get, their hourly rate would go higher. Right? So they couldn't negotiate their pricing. Exactly. Okay. They couldn't. Interesting. 
Yeah, super interesting. It worked well for us because most of these events, they were one-off events, right? It wasn't that they would be able to make their own deal, you know, like, uh, you know, go around us for the next upcoming event, right? Most of their events were in one-off events. And, um, and at the same time, events are something that you cannot negotiate timing, right? A lot of photographers, if they're, you know, they're booked on the weekends, right? If you contact them late, right? So there's scarcity of supply as well. Mm-hmm. And sorry, I'm, I'm going to keep poking here because it's extremely interesting and selfishly, uh, I'm getting better ideas. So if I'm candid and you're telling me how much I am, you're going to charge for my service, I might not command a higher price because I might not be the best photographer, or maybe I don't think I am, or maybe I'm new at it. How are you sourcing then your photographers? Because you dictated your own margins. Yeah, yeah. We kind of played around with the idea. Initially, we start off with saying like, hey, we're going to give photographers $20 an hour, right? Like these guys are not, like we have, I have photographer friends that they're not doing anything, you know, most of the time. All of a sudden, they get a job that they, they charge like $200 an hour, but yep. most of the time, they're not doing anything, right? Yep. So I'm like, okay, what if I give you more jobs, but we charge yep. less, right? And in the beginning, I was even more naive. I was like, man, how hard is it to do take photos? You got to take a, get a fancy camera, right? And maybe I can get just get no, that's any it. That's it, Sasha. Of... You just get a fancy camera and you're done. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I Because I, t- I tested it myself. I was like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a $300 camera. I'm going to go to a birthday party and do it myself. How hard can it be? Right? <laughs> So uh, the na- the the naiveness can kind of really like help you in like these <laughs> scenarios. But then I so then that was the original idea to buy a bunch of cameras, give it to people who don't have any photography background, and maybe have someone else these online kind of editing platforms edit our photos for us afterwards, right? And make them pretty and all that. So we decided when we started to source photographers, I mean, put on Craigslist, hey, twenty bucks an hour. We never thought like professional photographers would apply, right? Because they were saying like $150, $200. But then we noticed that 80, 90% of them are people who are actually professional photographers, right? And they're not getting enough gigs. We're like, oh, wait, what's what's up with that, right? So it was a nice epiphany. But then over time, we're like, okay, 20 doesn't work, 30 doesn't work, 40, 40 is a good starting rate. What if we could gamify it so they give us good quality or okay, more five, every five five star reviews, the hourly rate goes higher. And then um, we did a lot on our own back end to be able to vet the photographers, right? Because we had we were guaranteeing quality, right? And also being able to how to match what photographers to what events. So build algorithms for that as well. So real quick, um, what year did you and David like start uh, Wedding Snap? Twenty twelve. Uh, no, twenty twelve was when we launched. I think twenty eleven was when we like started working on the idea. And Ever Snap Photography. What year was this when you guys? Well, I mean, not really pivoted entirely, but added this as a major pivot. Yeah. I want to say late 2014, early 2015. Yeah. You'd already been married. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Already been married to the idea and then decided like, you know, based on the data and and the marketing. Yeah. 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 And Seth, let's be honest, like the idea, like kicking off 60 K and MRR isn't a rounding error. Like that's a solid idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Impressive. So what, what happened after, like, uh, you guys have vetted or validated this to a certain degree, you're starting to get more traction and, and interest. What was the next phase of uh, Eversnap's journey? So the next stage of Eversnap journey was that um, scaling through sales. You know, we noticed that now the game starts changing, right? Every time, like, these pivots, like, the whole game starts changing. You... I think we didn't realize how much the whole game starts changing, okay? How much now the distribution channels change. Now we're going to B2B sales. Now I'm, I'm doing like CRM, like Salesforce CRM and doing like cold emails to these conferences to book, you know, that hiring a salesperson. And that's what's needed for us to get to the next stage, you know? Um, and it was, it was fun and games, you know, for me. 
But for both me and my co-founder, our passion was kind of dying down, you know, for the idea. It was, it was another point of like, you know, this is not exciting to us, right? And both of us, fortunately or unfortunately, we were those crazy people that only want to work on things that we love, you know? And no matter what, we're like, nah, you can't, you can't pay me enough to do this job, you know? Um, so that's when um, we were doing okay, we were doing good, um, but his heart wasn't into it. And my heart was also trying to come out of it. I was starting to get more and more distracted. And I, we decided to, you know, he decided to, him, him and Michelle decided to leave the company. And I was totally okay with that on great terms. Um, and then um, me uh, at that time, I was like, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to just automate this business, right? So it can run on its own and be automated, have a, you know, customer support, have a salesperson, have an engineer who can do some maintenance and stuff, light development, have this thing run, its, run on its own. So we did that and that worked well for a while. It was bringing in income. And then what happened, I, I noticed that I had never had a real job in my life, uh, working for a company, working for people who, you know, um, a lot smarter than me in fields that interest me to learn from them. And I was like, you know, I want to go get a job, right? So that's when I was like, what job? I've always been a product manager in our own company. So I decided to apply for a senior product management position. And also it was a time that I fucking hated the Bay Area because of everything that happened to us and the culture and stuff. Like I just wanted to get out. So I, um, after testing out LA for a while, which is another option. Um, and New York, I decided to move to New York. I got a job for a, um, you know, a, a stealth mode startup, a YC startup that um, doing uh, as their first product manager and uh, doing some health tech stuff. And uh, after a while, um, after three, four months over there, I got fired from that job as well. Uh, me and C, the CEO, we weren't seeing eye to eye. Uh, being the first product manager of any startup is very tough because you're basically taking the CEO's job, right? Yeah. And I think he had some dualities about where the company wanted to go, but he wasn't really facing it. We're talking about it and our ideas were clashing. So I ended up having another meeting with all the co-founders at the same time at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> which this time I already knew what's up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Did it get any easier the second time? <laughs> um, it was really tough because I was, you know, I was really dedicated to the job. I loved the idea, the, the vision, where we're going. A lot of teams, I dedicated myself into it. And at the same time, that the CEO was a, um, um, he, very, he deceptively fired me, right? So he set me up for something that, a job that, um, you know, he gave me the wrong information. Then he told me, no, I told you this. It was very obvious that he wanted me gone at that time. Um, so that deceptively fired me kind of left a really bad taste in my mouth for, for, a, for a long while. Um, but then after a few months of, you know, um, enjoying New York that summertime, you know, and first, I'm kind of being free and having a little bit of money to be able to enjoy my life and, you know, and without worries. Um, I got another job, which ended up being almost the second chapter of my career book, because this job was, I, my, my goal was to learn from other people, right? And, and the reason I took this job was that the founder has sold his last company for $600 million and the company before that for $300 million. And this was a 20 people startup in New York City. And I get to work um, one level below this guy. There was, a, there was a guy between us, but we were always, you know, working together. And this man, he had such a, his mentality, the way that he would think, the frameworks, everything, the way that he would teach the culture of the company. It was so fascinating. Like everything he did a startup in a way that he knew it's going to be a thousand people company at some point, you know, like if you knew your company is going to be a thousand people company at some point, how would you do everything right from the first day on, which 
um, it was mind blowing the things that that he did. You know, the, his culture deck, his his frameworks for decision making, for project management, for putting some a lot of different ideas. I said the way he talked to people, the way he organized his his day. Um, so I ended up working for uh, for him for a year and a half. I learned so much. It was the best MBA I could have asked for. Um, and at the same time, um, during that, Eversnap was still going. Eversnap Photography was still going. We had a few people who were working for it full time. And then when the pandemic happened, um, at, at that time, we were right before the pandemic, our sales were even picking up. We were going even higher, you know, with conferences and events. We really nailed down. B2B sales and cold emails and all of that thing, we nailed it down. Um, but pandemic happened, photography market went kabam um, for events. Um, and that's when we decided to sell everything to, uh, to one of the competitors. Yeah, that must have been, been a tough, uh, you know, tough end, I guess, but with a, with a positive outlook. Um, yeah. How was it? What was it like, actually? You know, like assuming that your competitors are also kind of clashing with you as as you're going through the journey. Um, did you reach out to like how? How did you structure that? Like, re or just contacting your competitor and even bringing this up? Like, you know, would you? Be yeah. Interested? Yeah, we had a contact with each other. Like, I think a year before. I don't remember exactly why. Um, so we kind of knew each other a little bit and, um, you know, they were, they were a YC startup. And, um, so I contacted them again, you know, and this time, obviously we were more interested in selling. So, uh, the ball was in, was in their field and he was a very cut, cutthroat negotiator. Um, so yeah, the conversation was kind of you know it went relatively quick besides the um what's it called the the logistics of closing the deal and so you uh this was like early covid i'm thinking 2019 2020 you guys sold yeah yeah early COVID. Yeah. so you're still in new york at this point and uh was the sale kind of towards the end of this uh this other um, employment that you were also in, like with the with the mentor, yeah. Or, yeah. It was halfway through. It was halfway through. Yeah, it was after a few months. I was still. I still had my job there, and on um, you know at night times and weekends, uh, and then I would have meetings with the management of you know EverSnap, um, give guidances, run a few things, and that was it. Make just a few hours a month. No, that uh, I mean, you you can build a, a venture funded startup that way. So for people, yeah, <laughs> it's well, it, yeah. well, automations in those day and ages were still required a, you know, a certain level of technical ability and know how. Nowadays, it's a, it's gotten a lot easier. Um, yeah. yeah. So now, sold the company, and you're still working, and you're you're enjoying it by the sounds of it. Like, where what happens next? So I was still working there. Then I'm like, I get to a point that I've learned everything that I want to learn from this guy. And at the same time, I see a lot of their pitfalls. Like I was telling you, imagine if you were building a thousand people start from day one, that, that's, that is not necessarily also a great thing, you know, because you're not thinking MVP, you're not thinking, okay, getting something out as soon as possible. You're not thinking hypothesis testing, what if I'm wrong? So there was a lot of these things that they were just not seeing, right? Because none of them did, had- Were they funded, beat, beat. Sasha? Yeah. So, so the pitfalls was, um, one of the major things was that uh, not understanding the value of assumptions testing, right? And assumptions, cause, like if I were to say, what is my specialty, right? And everything that I do, you know, I've done in the past, I think going from zero to one, you know, is my special case. Going from just an idea to prove it to, okay, does it have value for product market fit? You know, to get into product, to the minimal product market fit, um, which is a very, very a different methodology than what, than scaling a product, to getting a product that's, you know, it's there. 
So the founder, even though he was very smart, you know, with everything that he did, but a lot of his experience came from enterprise software, right? There's a whole he was a other CEO. Ball game. Yeah, he was a CEO, exactly. You know. No, um, I think it, it's it's an important distinction, Sasha, because I, I I always say this, and Seth knows this about me. I equate it to like um, to like being a physician. You know, the orthopod he does the six knee replacements every day very monotonous very monotonous great making great income for me it's like i want to solve the problem the monotony is really boring to me so going from you know 10 million in arr to 100 million in arr maybe the problem's almost pseudo solved and you just need to scale as a ceo for me it's yeah. that zero to one it's that penny gap it's being an er physician where like all you see is puzzles you just see crazy puzzles and like yeah. and then and maybe you know i hear a little bit of like myself and you like after a while, great. We get great revenue, but my passion's gone. So it, it may, I think founders need to be honest with themselves about that. And it's not a bad thing. I think there's a stigma with being like, oh, now we got, you know, here's your VC show. Here's your board. Now we got to get a CEO. Great. Like, I'd rather go do the other thing that I do really well instead of scale by by adding. And, and I did want to ask one question on those trials and tribulations. Specifically, if he's done this in iterations and you've seen Bootstrap, was there money behind the company then for him to just make these assumptions? If they're wrong, throw money at it. Because that's a big oh, yeah, difference. Absolutely. 100%. Okay. He okay. had so much money, you know. Well, so he that's, had, okay. Like, that's a, a piece of context <laughs> that really helps founders. Like I'm bootstrapping for product market. No, it's not. We have assumptions because we have a lot of money behind this. <laughs> yeah. And if we're wrong, we'll just throw money at it again. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was throwing money at everything, you know. He had a team of, he hired teams of people to go manually sign up app users you know for testing within you know a, a mall a shopping center mall in some area you know um it was just insane you know some of the things that that we did but at the same time i felt like i was the only person over there who had any zero to one experience you know with, with b2c um i was speaking you know chinese to everybody else you know for lack of a better term, right? Um, and then I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna uh, do my job, learn the things that you know I, I'm learning, and um, and Take that's it. it. I mean, I, yeah. I I would always still push back, but then I knew that it's not gonna go go far. So where where did that like result in what you wanted? Like, so after a year and a half, you said you moved on, right? Or you decided as yeah try something else what was that so so it was the after a year and a half i started you know um um so what happens i realized okay i'm i've learned everything that i want to learn so so i was searching for my next idea what do i want to work on next and i was planning on kind of quitting around the summertime of 2020 right um but then the pandemic came and these guys were doing um, so bad metrics wise because they had launched after such a long time and the product wasn't really picking up and so on. Um, they decided to lay off like a huge percentage of the company. Right? So I got laid off uh, with some severance, which that was a, you know, it was a good thing for me at that time. I was like, okay, this is a, you know, uh, it's always easier when someone else ends the chapter for you, right? <laughs> and you, you try to end it yourself, right? Um, so fortunately or unfortunately, I've been on that side where more chapters have ended for me than I've ended it myself. Um, so I decided, so uh, that was it for me. Pandemic started, right? Uh, my girlfriend and I uh, went from a long distance relationship. She was living in SF. I was living in New York at the time. Went to moving together, to being 24 seven together. I was, I had this tiny one bedroom apartment in New York city. I, which was amazing for me, but for two, now nah, we wanted to kill each other after three days, <laughs> right? So after two weeks, I'm like, and then we uh, got I'm married. Like, oh, no, my she... brother has this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how yeah. it works. Like the kid Give will make it better. Line, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I promise. Let's have a kid. It'll make it'll make everything better. You're like, I know, right? Let's it's have that, that second kid because you know it's <laughs> yeah. the second one that makes it that much better. Like, all right, the third one, if this one doesn't work, then we should get yeah. a divorce. Like, yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, dude. It's crazy. It's insane. 
Oh. So anyways, I, I, um, I found, I realized, oh, my brother has this house in Charlotte that he's renting out. Maybe he has a spot in there. You know, we could go like in Charlotte, at least we're not trapped in, because New York City was the worst place for pandemic, right? It was, it was dead, right? It was all the like, um, cons of New York City with none of the pros, you know? Um, so we, uh, and my brother's house in Charlotte ended up being empty. So we moved to Charlotte in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, right? No car, nothing, no friends. We stuck to this, to, together in this house in the suburbs, right? And that's where we had to make shit work. And, and luckily for me, that was that everything happens, you know, looking back, everything happens for such great reasons. Um, I had start, I had just started my journey uh, learning about professional mental health and mental health. Right? So a few months ago in November of 2019, um, I had been, I, I told you I used to read a lot. Um, I came across this uh, bestseller called How, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, which talks about the history of psychedelics and all that. That's I had some one. experience with psychedelics, uh, which was mind blowing, but now I get to learn this other perspective of it. And I was like, holy shit, I need to, I need to try this. I need to try this. So I find some therapist, you know, who like secretly is able to give me a, you know, psychedelic assisted session. And he, and he didn't even know anything about psychedelic assisted therapy. I was like, don't worry about it. I've read all the books. Here's a book that you should read. I gave him this manual about how to sit with somebody. You just, you just sit with me. You just like, you know, like a babysitter, you know, and while I take a shit ton of LSD, right? So uh, we do that. Um, All right. <laughs> so deep into the rabbit hole. <laughs> no, no, we're done. We're done. All you do, it's just like photography. You just kind of like do some shit. And like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to put you in front yeah. of, of Bluey, the TV show, and you're just going to do a bunch of LSD and I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm downloading your app right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So, so that's how we start. You know, we get into this. I'm like, let's just try it, right? And um, and I pay him a lot of money for like, you know, 14, 15 hours of like 10 hours sitting with me and plus in preparation integration sessions and all that. And um, mind you, after that, I had a crazy mind-blowing experience. Like I felt like some deep wirings inside my head had just shifted changed in all the best ways right i was feeling like a fucking king for the next few weeks you know i was literally a, a king you know and nothing could bring me down you know nothing right um and 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 some thoughts and ideas in my head that first of all some some things the ways of thinking that i never even thought that's my way of thinking just completely changed from inside out yeah right? towards the better so coming out of that, I never had any exposure to mental health before that, right? I was like, oh, mental health for for people who have big issues. They 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 got big traumas, and you know, that oh, something happened to child. I got a good childhood. I got a normal childhood. You know, my parents are this. Da, da, I'm good, right? But then I was like, man, if I've changed this much, and this is possible without enforcing willpower and affirmations. I am great. I am beautiful. Da da da. Every day, and everything changed from inside out. Like, what is the potential, right? So, I decided. Okay, I've read a lot of all these, you know, self-help best-selling books on Amazon about how to be pro more productive, atomic habits, this that, habits of highly successful people, right? But what I don't know is the professional therapy world. You know, what is the what are the you know tools that they work with? What are the their frameworks? There, you know. So I start, you know, taking random therapy sessions with different therapists and seeing how they work, learning about different methodologies, right? Um, so when the pandemic happens and we go to Charlotte by ourselves, that's where it's a double down on this work, right? Read more, study more. I go back to, okay, now I want to go from zero to one. I want to go from nothing. I don't have any idea. How do I find fine tune into like a problem in this field that I'm interested in that I want to solve, right? Um, 
But see, Seth, you, you can see you can see the passion already coming out now and how he's right? talking about it. So it's like yeah. that's awesome. That's how you know it's like ah oh, fucking neuroplasticity. Like that's what I'm gonna go look for. And not only that, yeah. but coming from somebody who's worked on his passions already all his life, and then yeah. at you know we'll call it middle age now, right? We're all we're all in there. Yeah. Like <laughs> to have this kind of second coming and be like, okay, this is what I want to put my energy into. That's amazing. And, and now he's in Charlotte, so he can just go in the woods and get just super fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to worry about people for miles. No, he's like the schnozberries taste. He's like licking a tree. Like, <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> Again, <laughs> subscriber number one to your app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, but I mean, this is a super, so... not, it's not super saturated. So I'm really, I mean, I don't want to say super, but the satiety of this, this specific space. So I'd love to hear like kind of what was that next move then? So, so I'm reading the different, you know, methodologies. I go to Google trends. I study, okay, what are the top methodologies? CBT, DBT, EMDR, right? I go down the list. What is this about? What is that about? Researching where the emotions come from, like having notes on my wall about how you know the brain works and, and, and things like that. And um, and then I came across and one of the therapy sessions that um, you know I was doing with a therapist. Uh, me and my girlfriend at the time we were doing the therapy sessions together at the same time, um, so we could see what the therapist does to the other person, right? um so this is this is actually that? one of my therapists well this is my therapist and he does psychedelics he microdoses and he yeah. no i'm just saying like it's it's very much something that's coming into the mainstream mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely so um yeah so we, so I, I see the therapist does this technique with my girlfriend that completely shifts her and brings another side of her that was not visible at all you know but you could see it's there right like she was very afraid of um speaking about her anger right because a part of her said that you cannot be angry so this would kind of fester inside you turn into this like passive aggressiveness and things like that but then all of a sudden you could see that there's two parts of her one part says i i cannot express my anger you know uh one part says you cannot express your anger your anger is damaging and and, and can be very harmful and the other part says i am angry you know i have fucking anger right and this together is just like built so much inside so he did this technique and i was like man this is mind-blowing how did you do that where can i le learn more about this so that's when i came across this methodology called internal family systems ifs right at that point it wasn't famous yet right it was the beginning days of it um so i book a therapist I, I find the best therapist i can find in europe because they're a lot cheaper over there and um, I booked some therapy sessions and, and I have my first sessions and I have holy shit epiphanies coming up, you know, something incomparable with anything else, almost close to psychedelics, right? Um, all of a sudden, like some childhood memories that I've never thought of come up in the middle of the therapy session and kind of reveal some, you know, sense of abandonment from when I was seven years old and I felt left alone in the school cafeteria, you know, by myself in the first English speaking area. And I didn't understand what they're saying. I felt abandoned, you know, then dots start connecting. Oh, maybe this is why I feel defensive when, you know, I get into an argument because I'm trying to avoid feeling abandoned again. Right. Um, and stuff like that start happening completely mind blowing, but at the same time, um, again, changing the hard wire from inside my head and my subconscious, because as I'm, studying these therapy models and experiences with psychedelics are, I'm making a checklist of what is the best model. You know, it needs to be, for example, self-healing, right? Like I am the best person that can heal myself because I have more information than anybody ever can have, you know, other people can guide me, but at the end, the healing is done on through my hands, through my um, psyche or that the fact that, um, I forgot. They had a few other checklists for this thing. And IFS matches these checklists, right? Um, a compassion-based system. Oh, a, a healing is something that doesn't require willpower, force of willpower, right? Because there's only so many times you can force yourself to go to the gym at 5 a.m., you know? Uh, only so many times you can force yourself to do this, to have discipline, this, that, 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 that. You know, 
you know, then, you know, you'll, you'll shove your face into the pizza box and the wings and, and, and all of that. And, you know, things like that will happen. Right. Um, the answer is not willpower. The answer is internal change, internal hardwire change. So I find IFS, I'm super fascinated by it. At the same time, I'm still studying other methodologies. I'm like, no, IFS is the shit. Um, so I started uh, dabbling down, getting, going through the, all the therapy training programs. So I'll do all the trainings that therapists do for IFS, become an IFS practitioner, which is almost the same as an IF, IFS therapist. Um, it's just the word therapy in the US is very protected by the licenses and stuff. Um, and then I do all the levels of IFS his training get to the highest level even learn from the founder himself and at the same time as i'm exploring ifs i'm like man this can be turned into an algorithm right and this is something that a software can do a lot of it right now like maybe 60 70 percent right now and with ai 10 years from now software can do this 10 times better than a, a human practitioner you know um so i start testing i make a chatbot you know to test out uh, i map out the algorithm right i to create a chatbot based on that algorithm and i test it with people and people are sending me, giving me feedback uh, a lot of people are having really good results with that um and then i'm like okay uh, this can be turned into an app because the chatbot has a lot of ux pitfalls an app can fix right so that's when we started creating IFS Guide. This is the name of my startup right now. The point of it is to make mental health more affordable and accessible to everyone. And then we got very lucky. And it was kind of obvious for, to me from the start that IFS will explode. Um, to, in the next in the next year after that, all the big name podcasts started talking about it. Tim Ferriss made a podcast about it, kind of saying psychedelic experience without the psychedelics. You know, um, a lot of huge celebrities endorsing it. Now to become an IFS therapist, there's, I heard somewhere between a five to seven year waiting period to do the training program, right? Uh, to be an IFS therapist. Um, so I do some one-on-one -on -one clients myself um, uh, on a weekly basis. At the same time, mostly I'm working on the software, the app, the algorithm that can scale to many people. Um, we're, we're super excited. I, I realize we're still we're pretty early for IFS Guide, but um, for our viewers, you know, as you kind of follow along over the the months or the years after this episode, we, we're we're gonna check back in uh, over time to see where we're at. But hey, this was this was absolutely amazing, Sasha. We really appreciate the the entire story. I, so actually, because I know you personally, and and um, we, we uh, I've seen it in action. I need to kind of highlight one aspect of you as well, the bachata. Uh, and I hope I'm saying it correctly. I, you are by far one of the, so that's another passion project, Raj, that I have seen in person. Actually, the, Sasha uh, invited me to a couple of like beginner classes there too. It was a lot of fun, but you know, it, it's kind of like saying like when ping pong, right? Like people play for fun. They don't really worry about spin and stuff, but this man right here is probably like the top 1,000 players in the world <laughs> that dance. So let, let's kind of talk a little about that. Yeah. Play ping pong? Bachata. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to be that guy. Too, but... <laughs> I had to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, um, I was. I, I've always been a, like man who's been very distracted with many different things to do and learn and and you know and all that so i've had many different hobbies uh, growing up i used to play sports you know a lot um and and but when i came across bachata which was right after college it was like then i realized man not all hobbies are the same some hobbies can actually you can hit multiple birds with the, with the, with one stone you know um it was i i enjoyed dancing um it was it was also an exercise it was physical um coming out of a, a kind of like a majority guy engineering program i was meeting a lot of girls you know they were they you know they you know all of a sudden I, I, I didn't need to do much work to get interest because the number of guys were a lot less especially young guys so 
I got really attracted to bachata dancing and I really enjoyed dancing myself. So I, um, that was my escape in my startup life. If I didn't have the Sunday nights, I would go dancing. I would drive an hour every Sunday to go to the city to dance um, bachata and come back at four in the morning. I would cancel all my meetings for Monday morning. And I have my Monday morning, <laughs> nothing happening. Um, that was my escape. Without it, I don't think any of the, any of the sort of stuff would have happened, you know. No, it's, it's super, uh, super important it's still, you know, just as human beings to, uh, to yeah. have something on the personal side. So that's awesome. And I, I was telling Seth, I, I chatted him privately. I apologize. Um, I'm awkwardly like you. I'm curious about everything. So I'm pretty detail oriented. Um, and Seth, my question was, you have one nail, no nails. You play guitar. Yeah, I play. I play uh, classical, flamenco guitar. I used to play. Uh, yeah. Super cool. <laughs> Super yeah. cool. Do you play? Uh, I used to, but then I realized I sucked. So that was the oh. end. Of that. <laughs> it's pretty simple. We have like about five, uh, five, ten minutes left uh, before we have to wrap up. So, um, Sasha, I know. Obviously, as a founder who's been doing this for such a long time with different experiences, early employee, founder, um, you know, also gone through like the accelerator side and seen a lot of other successes and failures. Like, I know that you still enjoy working with early stage founders. Can you kind of tell us a little about that? Like, what kind of founders or what kind of startups do you enjoy? Like, if, if they want to reach out to you, who, um, who, who would you prefer working with? Your ideal founder fit. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, right now, I've been so tied up in my own startup that I haven't had a lot of time to offer myself. But I, I yeah, I, I'm very open to um, speaking and exchanging knowledge. The ideal type, I think first thing that comes to my mind is full-time founders. Right. People who are fully committed to their project, you know, not just a hobby to see if it goes or not. Um, secondly, um, people who have done some of their, their own homework in terms of reading the content about what it takes to go from zero to one, understand what customer discovery is, understand, you know, uh, that. And then together talking about, okay, now, you, you've learned the things that you can learn from the two, three books that you can learn publicly to you know, get all this knowledge. Now, what are the, how can we troubleshoot the, sp the specific things that are happening to you, right? And B2C, definitely B2C is, is uh, B2C or B2 small B, small businesses. You know, I've done that as well. Uh, marketplace, um, I have plenty of experience with that. And definitely, um, mental health and things that are kind of chatbot driven as well where, where can people find you they can find me at um, if you go to sashaislami.com you'll see all the appropriate links for all my project and also contact me yeah email is sasha at sashaislami.com yeah Appreciate it, bro. Uh, Raj usually ends our episodes with a with an open question, and I'm sure you you know Guy Raz how I built this. So he always asks in the end, percentage wise, Sasha, luck versus hard work. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, um, everything is luck. Um, I think at the end of the day. Um, even if we get to hard, do hard work is because some shit lined up in our life that taught us to do hard work and, you know, taught us that this is what it takes to, to become successful. Right? So at the end of the day, I think that um, we have very little um, choice in, in how things turn out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know if, if I listened to myself five years ago saying this, I was like, yo, what the fuck are you talking about, bro? Um, but, but knowing what I know about mental health and, and, and how, you know, we become to be the people that we are today, I can see like, man, um, if I have any success by 
society's measure of success. This has, has you know, nine, 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 nine percent of it has been being at the right place, right time, growing up, you know, all of that, you know, everything. No, thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic. Uh, um, you know, the, not many people get to see, you know, this kind of stuff, like the, the story from that perspective, but then all through all the trials and tribulations. So we, we yeah. really appreciate you sharing that and, and pouring your heart out. Um, a quick plug in for the Startup Suzers concierge for our, our viewers. Um, so the whole point about Raj and I interviewing our friends is that not only do we have a personal relationship with them, but then we can vouch for them as early stage founders. And then in my case, I've been an XBC as well. So if you're going through a problem, whether it's personal, professional, related to your startup, we're all founders here. We understand what goes into it. Um, the concierge, you will find either myself or Raj there where we can hear you out for a free 20 minute session whenever. Um, understand what problem you're facing. And then if it's somebody like Sasha, you need to get connected to or somebody else from our network, we do a pretty good job of matching them. So definitely check us out at the concierge. Um, Sasha, appreciate you, bro. Uh, excited for you to visit again soon so we can kind of really up the Eversnap Mansion days. But <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm super excited for what's happening with IFS Guide with you and uh, personally. And um, yeah, just uh, all the best for the future, bro. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you guys. I definitely do. And I know stuff you've been contributing and helping startups for for over a decade now, right? I, um, I, you know, yeah, you've done a lot for the scene. I hope someday you show up on some stage and they give you some sort of award. And because you definitely deserve it. Uh, and Raj, you too. Thank you guys for bringing this for the startup entrepreneurs. It's, it's, it's tough to make it out there and, and any, any help, you know, is, is great. So thank you guys. With that, we're going to end the recording here, but hey, thank you so much. We'll see you again next week.